Hi everyone, and if it's not your first time here, welcome back. Today we talk with Thomas. I had so many questions as usual, my curiosity got the better of me. So I kind of had to create a bonus episode with my random questions. When else do you get the chance to talk to somebody in conservation and ecology and someone who knows so much more about the geography of their country than you do? I'm definitely not a geographer. I have another question, and this is, sorry, again, left field. Yep. Is it in New Zealand that you have merino wool or is that Australia? Uh, We both have merino wool. Yeah. Just wondering how much damage they do to the landscape. Have they adapted? Mm, Yeah, it's less about the actual animal itself. And I guess it's more to do with the, you know, you've got to clear the land for pasture. You've got to burn down or cut down the forest and that kind of thing. So you've got to basically take away all that habitat to turn into large open fields to keep them. And so I think it's less about the animal itself and more about the the requirement for the animal to live um, and that you have to clear all the land. But of course, you know, uh, things like cows and and sheep, they do excrete a a reasonable amount of poop. And that ends up making it into our waters, our streams and rivers and that kind of stuff. So they're quite polluted as well. Um, Again, they're trying to bring that back and that kind of thing. So there is a lot of things around that of how they kind of wreck the environment i guess yeah so is rabbit stew something that's really popular in new zealand to try to get rid of the rabbits uh yeah if you can catch them pretty hard to catch (laughs) it's funny because we catch rabbits here a lot really yeah we put rabbit traps and you'll catch one like wild hares or rabbits whatever it's all the same to me yeah i don't know if traps are a big thing over here i know people do still do a lot of shooting oh yeah no here it's traps yeah Yeah, I don't know if we do a lot of traps here. They should come and visit Canada, see the indigenous populations, because we catch a ton of rabbits. Yeah. Because they breed very quickly, so. Yes, they breed like rabbits, even. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like my cousin, the registered trapper, so he has trap lines for all kinds of animals. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe traps don't work in your climate, like, I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, I I don't know. I don't know if that's just, like, a cultural thing, like, we just never really got around to doing it, or something like that don't know yeah because if it's not native to your land your indigenous population wouldn't know how to deal with it so yes well that's that's the thing right yeah that's kind of one of the other problems is you know all of these um animals that maori made quite a lot of use of not allowed to do anything with them anymore because they're all very endangered so the kind of thing about that is if a native bird is found dead um it automatically becomes property of the department of conservation department of conservation then takes that bird and they will often give it to various iwi, which is Māori tribes, to do various things with them, you know, turn them into cloaks or, you know, as, as other kind of ornaments and, and various things. So they still do get to use them, but it's obviously, there's no one's going out hunting all of these birds to try and get their feathers specifically. So there is a bit of that, but it is um it is quite difficult in that there's no kind of, I guess, uh, knowledge about how to deal with these animals from a Māori perspective, at least, because they, you know, they weren't here originally. But in saying that, I did read an article the other day that they are looking, um, a particularly a group of Māori scientists are looking at how we can use toxins from local plants to create like a poison bait to combat rats, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Because basically, if there's anything that I like a lot, it's a local solution to a problem. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's quite cool. I I really like that idea. This is the really cool thing about if we can find a toxin that is derived from a local plant, it's nice because it's derived from nature. I mean, I guess all poisons are. But the thing is, if we can use that, it means that a lot of our native species will already be immune to it. Exactly. They're used to it. It's always been here. So it will have a much lower non-target risk of catching them right honestly the only landscape i know of new zealand is like lord of the rings which i know is really cheesy and all (laughs) you and every other bastard (laughs) (laughs) i know i'm sorry (laughs) like you have tropical too right it's not just the the mountain ranges yeah a lot of stuff that you see in lord of the rings is from the south island um which is a lot of that yeah hills and mountains and but the north island is different yeah 
Yeah, it's more like rainforest, I guess, because the birds seem to be tropical almost. Uh, not quite. No, it's not quite tropical. Yeah, it's more. Um, it's more temperate kind of uh, forest, which for a lot of people doesn't mean anything. Like we have boreal forest, right? So like pine and birch and. You know, that kind of stuff. Sorry, it's because I only knew my plants in French. So (laughs) I have to really think about it. New Zealand's quite difficult because it doesn't have a lot of trees that are everywhere else. Oh, okay. Our trees are very, very old in terms of their evolutionary lineage. Um, or at least a lot of them are. I've talked about this before in other places, but you walk into the New Zealand bush and it's it's like stepping back through time. You feel like you're back when the dinosaurs were around. Um, if you've ever watched, you know, like dinosaur docos and stuff, they show the dinosaur wandering around and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. They always got like lots of big ferns and lots of, you know, big trees and stuff. It's like that, except it's real and you can just walk into the middle of the bush and find it. <laughs> So New Zealand's very different. So you have heavily treed areas, not just the mountain ranges, but you do have heavily treed areas. Yeah, lots of trees, lots of big, tall ferns that look like trees. You know, that kind of stuff. It almost looks tropical. Maybe that's why, because the pictures make it look almost tropical. Yeah, it's close. It's more tropical than your forests, but it's not quite as tropical as actual tropical necessarily so it kind of sits in the middle because this was one of the things that maori were kind of had to get used to is that they were from a tropical region they came over and actually it was pretty cold here um at least in comparison Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so so that was kind of one of the things that they were dealing with so yeah so our, our forests are kind of a bit weird and a bit different so how come your birds are so colorful um i guess that's a part of it is just birds just generally are colorful you know, it's part of their kind of uh, mating displays. and Not around here. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I mean, we have blue jays and um, oh, what are the red birds? The, what are they called? Cardinals, I think, in English. Right, I see. Yeah. But I mean, our birds are plain looking. Yeah, that might be a tropical thing then. That's why I was thinking it was more tropical, yeah. Yeah, tropical birds tend to be quite colourful, so that might be part of it. But I think part of it is also, you know, we've been isolated for so long and that kind of stuff as well it ends up you know you get lots of really weird animals a lot of really interesting looking animals yeah yeah and the flowers and such too is it flowers year round or is it springtime summertime kind of thing um depends on the plant usually if i'm honest i don't know as much about plants i'm not a plant guy so (laughs) because the birds tend to go with the plants you know i don't know around here it's our winters are long so we only have about, mm. oh gosh, flower-wise, we have maybe like five months of flowers. Yeah, I'm not really sure on that one. What I do know, sort of bringing it back to kākāpō, is that kākāpō only breed in mast years, which are years that the beech forest trees produce loads of fruit. Oh. Yeah, which is like once every, I think it's like five-ish years, four-ish years or something. Wow. That's why they're they're in trouble, yeah. Yeah, so this was kind of kind of the problem. They don't breed that often. And there's no way to control the mast year because the mast year is based on all sorts of different factors. So what they tried to do was to imitate a mast year. If you just give the kakapo loads of food, surely then it will just breed anyway because it doesn't know the difference between a mast year and you just giving it food. But the problem that they had was the kakapo, when the female gets to a certain weight, it would actually produce They produce one gender more favorably than the other or more often than the other. And that's to do with, again, complicated evolutionary things. That means one gender is generally more, it's more favorable in those conditions than the other. I think it's females. When they get to a certain weight, it's females because it's like, well, if there's loads of food, it's better to have females because they need more, they need more food to produce more chicks. But if there's not as much food, you should produce males just because they don't need as much food to produce chicks. So what they found is they're producing more females, which is not great because you still need males to make chicks. Well, yeah, of course. (laughs) Yeah, so what they did is they built these hoppers because they had the kākāpō were going up to these hoppers sitting on a pressure plate and they would open the hopper for them to eat. But they encountered this problem. So what they did is they stuck like electronic kind of tracking device things on their backs that knew who the kākāpō was. And the people would monitor the kākāpō and find out how much it's eating, what its weight is, you know, all part of that kākāpō recovery program. What they ended up doing was the kākāpō could, you know, rock on up to the hopper and, you know, sit on the pressure plate. But then the little electronic device on their back would communicate to the hopper 
And the hopper would either go, yep, you're not big enough or, or you're allowed to eat and open up. Or it'd go, no, you're too fat. I'm not giving you anything and it wouldn't open. <laughs> <laughs> Because the other thing is we don't know a lot about how this works either. A lot of stuff about New Zealand birds, we don't actually know a lot about why they do certain things or how they do certain things or... Do they hide very well too? Like, are they hard to find? Is that another issue? They are now. Yeah. uh, Because there's only 200 of them left. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, in saying that, we know where all of those 200 are. Um, they've all got names, so so if if you know where to go, like, it's not that hard. But out in the wild, when they're a bit more abundant... Yeah, I I guess it would be. Um, Henry did say it was very, very difficult to catch them on his own. Mm -hmm. So they're scared of humans. Yeah, I I guess so. Yeah, you know, a big old person rocking on up to them, probably freaking them out. Well, yeah. (laughs) But I mean, you know, as I said, Henry was hearing them all over the show, you know, booming all the time and stuff. So he knew that they were around. But yeah, I guess he just struggled to to find them and to catch them um, just because, yeah, he needed the dog. So yeah, I suspect they're actually quite difficult to find. It's a silly question. <laughs> there are no silly questions. There's penguins in New Zealand? There is penguins in New Zealand. Okay. I've had much more silly questions like, are penguins a bird? So we've got five or six different species of penguin, I think, that breed on the mainland here in New Zealand. Yep, quite a few. Even though it's not cold. Even though it's not cold. See, this is a common misconception. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it was perpetuated by happy feet. <laughs> that, that penguins actually... Uh, that they're really into the cold, you know, um, and that they, they have to have snow. Well, me, it's more I'm thinking of like kingfisher penguins or emperor penguins. They tend to. Yeah, but you also get uh, penguins in the Galapagos Islands, which are in uh, on the equator. And you also get uh, penguins in Africa as well. So they're all over the place. Yeah. Like, what's the difference between a penguin and a regular bird? Just for me. All penguins are flightless. Their flippers or their wings are actually used for going underwater. So they kind of, that's kind of what they do. They, they fly under the water, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. And how's that different from other birds like a duck? Uh, so a duck, um, its wings are more feathery. So they spread out a lot more into like wings that you'd kind of know. So that's kind of a different function. Whereas penguins have more like flippers. Their wings are more like flippers. They move them to kind of push the water. So it's feathers, but they're not, they don't spread out the same way. Basically, yeah. Okay, this is just because I'm curious. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, peng- penguins are, are a lot different to kind of regular birds, I guess if you want to put it that way. Yeah, so so the family of penguins, like the ones in Africa, have different functions depending where they are. Yeah, you know, there's these big penguins, little penguins, you know, all that sort of stuff. So yeah. Sorry, total tangent. <laughs> <laughs> Was it really the rabbits that started all that off? It seems like it. The rabbits became a problem. Yeah, the, the rabbits was the, the was the catalyst uh, in the sense that once they brought over the rabbits and the rabbits spread everywhere, um, you know, the Europeans basically went, oh crap, uh, how are we going to stop this? And the logic was if the stoats and the ferrets and the weasels, they naturally hunt rabbits in England if we bring them over here, they'll hunt the rabbits here. Oh, in a sense, that's I can see the logic there. It makes sense. But they didn't account for the fact that the stoats are just going to go after stuff that is easier to get after, like the, the birds and the eggs and, and that kind of stuff. So in, in the case for mustard lids anyway, that was the reason that they were brought over. Um, rats were brought over accidentally because no one brings rats on purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's usually the case. <laughs> yeah, and possums were brought over for the fur trade because they got quite nice fur and, you know, you can turn them into gloves and socks and hats and all sorts of other stuff. But do you really need that in New Zealand <laughs> if it's not that cold? Yeah. <laughs> not really, no. Not really, but some guy thought we did, so he did. So you say the South Island, you meaning like the North and the South are actual two islands? I know there's multiple little islands, but... Yes. Interesting. I thought New Zealand was sort of a long, uh, like almost arc shape. No. So there's uh, there's the North Island, which is what I currently am sitting on, which is the Te Ika a Maui, the fish of Maui, because it kind of looks like a fish. And and the story is it was a fish and stuff. Um, and then there's the the South Island, which is Tawaipa Namu, which is the place of greens. And they're separated by um, Cook Strait which is just, yeah, a body of water in the middle. Can you swim it across? Like, or is it too wide? I mean, you can, but it's pretty dangerous. <laughs> People have done it, but like, it's it's not something... Similar to like England and France, and it is swimmable, but it is dangerous. It's real dangerous. I mean, it is a long way. Like, to go through on the ferry, it's about three hours, three and a half hours to go from the north to the south island. Oh, wow. Yeah, that would be too far. <laughs> yeah. 
in saying that though it's not that's not quite the case the ferry has to go through the marlborough sounds which is all these sounds in the top of the north uh, south island sorry so it has to go through it has to navigate those sounds for about an hour so you could sort of island hop a little bit yeah yeah so if you were going to swim the length of like the cook Strait, you wouldn't have to go for the whole distance that the the ferry goes you just have to hit land um so it wouldn't quite be as far but i mean it's still i still probably wouldn't advise it (laughs) no no gosh no no, no, I'm just just curiosity. See, I can find all this on Google, but it's way more fun asking people. <laughs> yeah. I know New Zealand, when Abel Tasman was here, he didn't really explore too much. So he actually thought uh, New Zealand was part of this larger, like, Terra Australis continent. Like, they thought it was this huge continent at the bottom of the world, which he was partly right. He, you know, he just didn't realize it was Antarctica and that we weren't connected to it. <laughs> And that's actually a funny thing about Resolution Island as well. It has a place called Five Finger Peninsula, um, which is kind of looks like an island, but there's a small bridge, um, like a small land bridge between the peninsula and Resolution Island. So it's technically actually part of Resolution Island. That's funny. So it's just when you said north and south, I I thought you meant just like north and south of the country. Yeah, no, it's uh, two separate islands. Yeah. So North Island and, and South Island. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a, we had an earthquake last night. It was our actually the one we had last night was the most felt all across the country. That's terrifying. I would take all this snow over tsunamis or earthquakes or <laughs> hurricanes or <laughs> any of that. That's scary. Yeah, I mean that's the thing is there's not much you can do about it. Like earthquakes, we don't know when they're coming. You just never know. You know they just happen. The thing about earthquakes is you can sometimes hear them before you feel them. Yeah, there's a rumble. Which yeah, it kind of sounds like a train or like the wind. You see this like, and you're like, what is that? It is funny though. You see people um, from overseas, an earthquake, a very mild earthquake happens and they freak out. That would be me. <laughs> and they're like, oh my God, oh my God. And every, all the Kiwis are just like, oh yeah. I'm going to wait a minute to see if it keeps going, if it gets strong. Like if it gets worse, I'll, I, I might get under, but you know, give it a minute. But yeah, no, we're just real chill about earthquakes now. We're just like, oh. Yeah, it's like us and snowstorms, I guess. (laughs) And bears. (laughs) 